Our presenter tonight is Dr. Nicole Zellner. Dr. Zellner is a professor of physics at Albion College and has served in leadership positions with the Astrobiology Society, the American Astronomical Society, and the Gordon Research Conferences on the subject of the origins of life. She is a NASA Solar System Ambassador and re has received many awards and honors for her research and other work in her field. Welcome, Nicole, and I'll turn the screen over to you now. All right, well, thank you so much for having me. All right, so today I'm gonna to be talking to you a little bit about um, a side project I have, which is related to understanding or just my interest in history of space. Um, I've become, or space exploration, I should say. Um, I have uh, been able to teach a first year seminar at Albion College called 100 Years of Space Exploration, which looks at who, um, has contributed to the exploration of space and how NASA is increasing the diversity of its workforce. As we think about returning humans to the moon in the near decade and potentially humans to Mars in the next couple of decades. Um, in the mid 2000s, I became aware of a group of female pilots commonly known as the Mercury 13. And it turns out that two of these female pilots um, all of whom were tested by the NASA astronaut doctor to see whether or not they were capable of withstanding the rigors of space flight. Um, two of these female um, pilots were actually from Michigan. And so now that I have um, transplanted myself into this state, I've become increasingly interested in the contributions of Michiganders to the exploration of space. Um, in 2019, during the 50th anniversary of the first Apollo moon landing, um, I wrote and presented extensively on the contributions of the male astronauts to space exploration. And today I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about these females, these women who may not necessarily have flown to the moon or actually didn't fly to the moon yet, um, but laid the foundation for um, why women make good space explorers. So I'm going to talk to you about women in space from the flats to Artemis and beyond and talk a little bit about the connections that Michigan has to this program. So in my um, readings and teaching my class, um, I have learned, as we all know, that there were tens of thousands of people in the United States working toward a common goal of getting humans to the moon and returning them safely to Earth. But a lot of the stories haven't been told until recently. And these are stories of the contributions of women, um, the contributions of African-American men and women as well. And they've been written up in several different kinds of books, um, a few of which I'll talk about today. And hopefully you'll be able to find from the library so that you can read them and learn about them on your own. And in, these, um, in this research and the discussions I've had with my students, we've talked and learned about the people in uh, and of Michigan who came from Michigan don't necessarily live here anymore, didn't live here at the time of the, the um, Apollo program and what their contributions were to the space exploration um, and, and getting to the moon and returning humans safely. Uh, getting to the moon obviously is not an easy thing, right? It's 250,000 miles away. It takes roughly two and a half days to get there. And it doesn't have water or oxygen or any of the life uh, supporting resources that we need on this planet. But still, people have been trying to get off this planet um, for, for a very long time. And finally, in the 1930s, uh, various types of chemicals were mi mixed together and uh, rocket fuels were developed to the extent that they could launch thousands of pounds off of Earth and into suborbits. Um, and this kind of technology was developed and perfected at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. As this technology became more and more common, and as the ideas for exploring space, going to Venus, going to Mercury, going to Mars, going to the moon, um, started to be expanded upon, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory put out many ads around um, California uh, recruiting computers. And these computers are not computers as we know them today, but people who would actually do calculations by hand to learn how much fuel was needed to launch how many pounds of rocket off the planet and what the trajectory and what the orbit would be um, of this rocket around the Earth or escaping Earth's gravity to go 
in, in, in to fly between Earth and Venus to enter Venus's orbit and so forth um, by asking or by soliciting people who had no degree, so no degree necessary, this was essentially a secret code, right? This meant that women could apply because women at the time were not likely to go to college and actually have advanced degrees. So the Jet Propulsion Laboratory then became one of the premier companies or premier organizations in the United States and still is um, that has a strong legacy of all female computer programmers. So this story Story is really nicely told in a book by Nathalia Holt called Rise of the Rocket Girls that talks about the contributions of these female computers to the history and progress made at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And um, these stories are beautiful, right? They're beautiful from the perspective of 2021, looking back on the conditions these women had to endure. They always had to wear pants, uh, I'm sorry, skirts with nylons, right? And they were very excited when pants became common wear and uh, they didn't have to bother wearing nylons and skirts anymore. They could actually go to work um, in pants believe it or not. Um, they could get married and have babies and still keep their job um, starting in the 1960s. So these are all things that we look back now and take for granted, but these women actually paved the way for um, equal rights in the workplace that we females um, get to um, experience today. Uh, one of my favorite quotes is by the um, supervisor of these rocket girls. Uh, they had to act like a, uh, look like a girl, right? Makeup, skirts, nylons, high heels, act like a lady, think like a man, and work like a dog, because these were the women who were making the calculations and doing the hard math that would actually launch rockets safely off of Earth and put them into orbit around other planets. Uh, by 1959, the United States was ready to announce its own astronaut corps to the United States in response to rumors that the Soviet Union, the arch enemy at the time of the United States, was getting to ready, ready to launch its own astronauts or cosmonauts into space. And this followed on the very successful flight of Sputnik 1 in 1957, which was a Soviet, um, um, very small Soviet satellite that was uh, put into orbit around the Earth. And every 90 minutes, you could see it blink overhead. And this was something that really frightened um, people in the United States because we were afraid that the Soviets were going to be taking over the planet and also taking over uh, space in general. Uh, so the United States answered back by uh, developing its own astronaut corps. In 1959, this very first group of astronauts was selected. These are known as the Mercury 7. They were hand selected by Dr. William Randolph Lovelace the second, who was the official NASA doctor, and he had a long history of being interested in understanding the effects of weightlessness on the human body. He had reported uh, for many years about different experiments that had been done on animals that had been launched into space, and then extrapolated those results to determine and see what kind of effects they would actually have on human beings. Uh, so Lovelace and his friend Donald Flickinger of the Air Force, because of their international science conferences that they had gone to, had heard how the Soviet Union was planning to send a woman cosmonaut into space um, to follow in the space footsteps of Yuri Gagarin, who was the first man in space. The Soviets at the time believed in equality for all, so they thought if we're sending male cosmonauts into space, we should be sending female cosmonauts as well. So Lovelace and Flickinger thought, well, why can't the United States send women into space, right? How do, why can't we test to see whether or not women could be just as capable capable of withstanding the rigors of space as, as the Mercury 7, for example? Um, women are lighter. Uh, they weigh less, they breathe less oxygen, they eat less food. They, um, so, so the rockets that would launch them into space wouldn't, be need, wouldn't need to be weighted down with as much fuel as, it would, as they need to be for the men. So let's test some women to see whether or not they could uh, withstand the rigors of space. 
NASA, however, was not interested in testing women. Um, they were not interested in seeing whether or not women could uh, fly in space. So Lovelace and Flickinger broke off from NASA and started their own private testing uh, company or their own private testing practices known as the Women in Space Program. And they based this out of uh, Lovelace's medical practice in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Uh, not very many records uh, still exist uh, to um, establish exactly who was tested and how they were tested, but some of the very early records um, show that Ruth Nichols was put through tests for Air Force pilots to see whether or not she could withstand the same stresses that Air Force pilots could um, experience when they go very high into space where there's very little oxygen and, um, and, and it's very dangerous to fly. So she was put through the same isolation tests, the same centrifuge tests, which is just a spinning contraption to see how much gravity or, or G's a body could withstand as the um, centrifuge is spinning around very rapidly. And also th through the same weightlessness tests, um, probably floating in water, for example, um, that was set to 98.6 degrees, the same temperature as the human body. So you, you feel weightless um, as you float in this in this, um, in this body of water. Um, these were the same tests that had been devised for the um, astronauts who would become the Mercury 7 and also the Gemini astronauts and the Apollo astronauts. So her test results were actually mixed, but showed that women could actually perform pretty well under stress. Uh, Betty Skelton um, is the next female pilot to um, come on to the scene in terms of testing women to see whether or not they could withstand the rigors of space flight. So Betty Skelton uh, went through the same Mercury astronaut tests as well, um, and she was uh, very charming. Uh, she had a wonderful personality and the Mercury 7, inter and she interacted with the Mercury 7 fairly frequently. They actually called her seven and a half. So she was well known in the astronaut corps at the time. And her story was picked up by the national media uh, when she and the tests that she underwent were featured as a cover story for Look magazine. Um, what's really interesting is Betty Skelton has a tie to Michigan. So she's the first woman I was able to find that um, underwent these tests with a tie to Michigan. Um, because of her automotive um, experience and because of her piloting experience, GM hired her to be a technical narrator at the auto shows. Um, she, she drove um, cars at the Chelsea Proofing Grounds, and then she eventually went on to become the official spokesperson for Chevrolet. So she's kind of our first Michigan tie in this whole story. Um, <clears throat> so Lovelace uh, was really interested again in um, testing more women. Um, and in the 1940s, he became friends with Jacqueline Cochran or Jackie Cochran, who is famous for being the first woman to break the sound barrier. She was also co-founder of the Women Air Force Service Pilots or WASPs. And these were women, if you know your history, who actually ferried uh, aircraft uh, between the United States and England and beyond during World War II to make sure that our uh, pilots would have the appropriate equipment um, to um, battle for the Allied forces during World War II. Um, working with Jackie Cochran, uh, he he and she, because she it, because she was known in the female pilot community, they came up with a list of women who would be qualified. Um, in terms of flight hours to um, undergo these astronaut uh, tests. Um, these women were known as the first lady astronaut trainees. Over 700 applications were evaluated. Uh, 25 women were tested and 13 made the cut. And so a lot of these women were very excited. It was very thrilling um, to think about the United States going into space. It was very thrilling to think about the United States having astronauts and these women who had just as many flight pilot hours, if not more, than the men were excited to think that they could have an opportunity to actually fly in space. Um, and so these First Lady astronaut trainees then or flats were recru recruited and tested to see if they had the right stuff. So who is Jackie Cochran? 
Jackie Cochran um, was a force, right? She's, she's quoted as saying, I may fly bombers, but I'm still feminine. And I think we need to think about what it was like to be a female pilot in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, and maybe even into the 60s. These women were expected to still look like ladies, right? Act like ladies, look like a girl when they're flying across the country, across the world in the various powder puff derbies and other kinds of flying races that they participated in. So they might stay for two or three days flying across the country or flying from Hawaii to England or whatever the race um, entailed, but when they came out of the cockpit, they had to put their skirts, or I'm sorry, before they came out of the cockpit, they had to put their skirts on, put their heels on, do their hair, put their makeup on, right? They had to still look like ladies when they came out of these, these, um, these uh, cockpits. Um, so, so Lovelace, um, reached out to Cochrane uh, to explore this idea. Cochrane was very rich. She married rich, um, and uh, she was very interested in trying to be an astronaut herself. Um, and so she supported the program. She helped Lovelace find the women. She helped recruit the women. She even devised some of the tests. Um, and it was part of her idea that she wanted to fly, that she uh, pushed Lovelace to expand the age boundaries so that women um, were tested a little bit younger and a little bit older than the males were tested, and um, also married women and, and mothers. Why shouldn't they be tested as well? So she allowed the data pool to, or the candidate pool to be expanded a little bit more. Unfortunately, she had a heart condition that um, precluded her from flying as much as she tried to convince Lovelace that she would be fine and she should go through these tests anyway. Um, he wanted to stick to the protocol that had been applied to the men and um, refused to allow her to continue with the tests. Um, she never really got over this rejection, unfortunately, and we'll see this play out maybe a little bit later, um, but she continued to leverage her connection. She's extreme, as I said, she was extremely well known. Um, she was known by presidents all over the world, and she had a lot of money, so people paid attention to Jackie Cochran. Um, Jerry Cobb uh, was one of these very uh, well-flown female pilots. She had accumulated multiple new world records, not only for speed and distance, but also altitude while she was still in her, in her 20s. Many of the women who qualified for Lovelace's testing program had actually started flying in their teens. Um, and they were most of them were, um, were, were from rural areas um, in the Midwest. Uh, so they were learning, they were dust cropper pilots and they were learning to fly um, um, within, at very local airports, uh, earning money to pay their way uh, lesson by lesson. So Jerry Cobb was one of these very first women who was recruited by Lovelace and by Donald Flickinger and underwent the same test as the Mercury 7. She excelled, she was um, nice looking, um, the media liked her, and um, she was very excited about the possibility of being a NASA astronaut. She became the self-assigned spokesperson for the testing program and became the woman who actually communicated with all of the other candidates in Lovelace's Women in, um, Astro the Women in Astronaut program. Program. <clears throat> what did some of these uh, physical and psychological tests look like? Well, they were beyond anything you and I could even imagine. Um, there were 75 different tests total, and they tested for everything, especially the unknown, right? Because we didn't know what space would do to a human body. The only specimens we had to compare to were the monkeys who had gone up into space and the Soviet dogs, who the American monkeys and the Soviet dogs who had gone up into space. We didn't know what space would do to the human body. Wally Funk in a um, interview on PBS Makers special said, there was not one hair tooth, skin, fingernail, through my whole body that was not tested, poked, prodded. They were finding out what every girl on that program was made of, just like they did to the guys. Um, they ran rubber tubes down the throats of the women and into the stomachs to see how much acid got produced in the stomach. They would shoot ice water into the ear and freeze the inner eardrum to see how long it took women or people to respond um, to the effects of vertigo. Um, but what 
the doctors were, in, and, and the women did, did fine. They did very well. In some cases, they did better than the men. And what the researchers were not expecting was that all of the women complained less. Now, whether that's just the nature of women in general, or whether um, it was them deliberately not complaining to look better to people who they thought would, would help them become astronauts, that's not quite clear. It's probably a little bit of both. So who are the 13 women who qualified? Well, they ran the gamut. Um, the oldest was Janie Briggs at age 41. She was the mother of eight. This, of course, is Janie Briggs Hart from Detroit, Michigan. And the youngest is Wally Funk. Wally Funk is still alive. There's about five women who are still alive. Um, we lost a couple last year. Um, but Wally Funk is still alive and, and, and she's still destined, uh, still determined, I should say, to fly in space somehow. Um, the very first twin astronaut experiment, you could say, um, was uh, conducted on Marion and Janet Dietrich uh, decades before Mike and Scott Kelly. Uh, and there were single women, there were married women and moms, um, all of whom were selected uh, by Lovelace and Cochran to undergo these tests. They had all accumulated individually thousands of hours of flying time. They had multiple aviation records, speed, altitude, endurance, um, 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 uh, time, right? So how fast they actually completed a certain amount of, um, of, of, of a race. Um, many of them were very, very accomplished on par with the, air, with the pilots who were selected, uh, with the male pilots who were selected by the, the NASA program. Um, these stories, uh, the one that I reference most is, is uh, written by Martha Ackman in a book called Mercury 13, but there's lots of books about these women and, uh, and I'll um, refer to a few of them in a, in a little bit. So um, who are the two Michigan women involved in this, in this study? The first is Bernice Stedman, um, also known as Miss B. She was born in the Upper Peninsula, but spent most of her life in Traverse City, Michigan. Uh, she was a member of the uh, female pilot program called the 99s. So she's a member of the Michigan 99s. Um, she had obtained her pilot's license at age 17. She worked at the uh, spark plug factory um, in order to earn the money so that she could pay for pilot's lessons at an airfield about 10 miles away from where she lived. Um, and when she um, got and she, when she got um, her pilot's license, she she wrote in her autobiography, "It's like the whole world opened up to me. It's like it, this pilot's license had essentially completed her." Um, she became an aviation instructor. She had won multiple air races, um, um, and then she was uh, selected by Lovelace to participate in this program. After the program ended, she co-founded the International Women's Air and Space Museum, and then also um, started her own aviation uh, uh, company in Flint, Michigan. Uh, her office was actually located at the Bishop Airport between the men's and women's restrooms, right? So not a very auspicious location, but she was very well known. She writes in her autobiography, People from Lansing and Detroit were driving to Flint to take lessons from me. I was good and I was really happy to be doing this. And uh, one of the um, our Air Force Reserve pilots who was taking lessons and keeping up on his time with uh, Miss B said, she's one of the best instructors I've ever had, as good as any man. So you know that she was well qualified to fly in space. When she was accepted into the program, she recommended to Lovelace and Cochran that they contact her friend, Janie Hart. So Janie Briggs Hart uh, was also a member of the 99s. Uh, she was uh, born and lived in Detroit, Michigan and got her pilot's license at age 18. In 1958, she was the first licensed female helicopter pilot in Michigan. And this enabled her then to fly her husband, Senator Phil Hart, uh, to his different campaign stops during his first term. But she wanted the world to know that she was more than a senator's wife and more than a mother of eight. So she accepted the invitation with the full support of her husband and children. 
I'm convinced it's because she wanted a little bit of peace and quiet for a little while and uh, took the time to go to Albuquerque where she spent a week there undergoing the tests with Lovelace and Flickinger. She continued after the program to be active as a pilot until through, uh, through the age of 60. And she also was a very active sailor sailing across the Atlantic at the age of 72. She supported the Equal Rights Amendment, the National Organization of Women and the League of Women Voters. She was definitely a force in the women's rights movement of the 1970s. So this testing then here, are a couple of examples of what some of this phase one testing looks like or looked like with the actual women uh, who participated. Uh, here's on the upper left hand picture, you can see an image of Jerry Cobb who was undergoing electrical stimulation. What was happening here is that they would increase electrical voltage into the different um, areas of the human body to see how the human body reacted and what a level of electricity or electrical stimulation the human body could actually endure. Um, here's a picture of Wally Funk in the sensory deprivation chamber. So this is a swimming pool essentially filled with water, um, uh, uh, heated to 98.6 degrees, the human body. And so when you're floating in the sensory deprivation chamber, you don't you don't know that you're floating because you, you can't feel any kind of temperature difference. Um, you have uh, goggles over your eyes, so it's dark. You have sound canceling, noise canceling, earmuffs over your ears, so it's very quiet. The whole room is dark, and basically you float in this body of water until you can't stand it anymore. Uh, Wally Funk uh, 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 endured longer than anyone, longer than any of the women, any of the men. She stayed in this chamber for 10 and a half hours. Uh, in the lower right hand, left hand corner, you can see uh, what I what I've labeled as physical endurance. Uh, what happens here is that the women, um, you can see they're strapped up to different um, electrical sensors and they have an oxygen mask as well over their nose and mouth and they're cycling. They're on a mechanical bike, just cycling, waiting to see how long they can cycle, uh, how quickly they can cycle. And then an assistant actually adds more and more weight onto the pedals. So they continue to pedal, but it, the pedals are getting um, heavier and heavier. And again, they're testing how long can you do this? How fast can you do this? When, when do you get exhausted? And finally, um, in the lower right hand um, is another image of all of the different probing that Wally Funk described, um, shooting water in the eyes, water in the ears, uh, tubes up the nose, tubes down the throat, just really trying to gauge um, the reactions of the human body to these different kinds of um, stimulations. Phase, uh, all of the women did well. All of these 13 women passed phase one and two testing, no problem, exceeding, doing as well as or exceeding the um, endurance of the Mercury 7 astronauts and the other astronauts who got tested. Phase three testing required access to the Naval School of Aviation Medicine in Pensacola, Florida. And this was part of the US Air Force. Um, and when Flickinger and Lovelace asked the Air Force for permission to bring women onto the base and allow them to test um, uh, in airplanes, and in particular in jet aircraft, the Air Force sent a note to NASA and said, what's this program and should we give permission to these people? And NASA said, what program? Because remember, this was a private testing program that Cochran and Lovelace had set up breaking away from NASA because NASA was not interested in testing women. But being two federal agencies, the Air Force couldn't give permission for these tests without the permission of NASA. NASA had no idea what the testing program was, so they never um, gave permission. They never approved the women to test there. Uh, Jerry Cobb was the only one who tested. She did very well, but the other women did not do so well. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, the other women were not allowed to test. They just weren't. They weren't allowed to test. They couldn't go there. But to show their dedication and knowing that the op option existed, that they could be denied, uh, didn't matter to them. Uh, again, they were very excited to be part of this program, to have the chance to perhaps fly in space, and to demonstrate how dedicated these women were. Two of the flats actually resigned from their jobs, their hard-won jobs in the 1960s, in order to participate. 
Uh, well, this didn't sit very well um, with the female astronaut uh, astronaut trainees, the late the flats. This did not sit very well with the flats. And uh, Janie Hart um, used her political connections with the president and with the White House um, in order to help convince Congress that there should be a women astronaut program that NASA should sponsor women astronauts in space and we should be the country to send the first woman into space. Um, so in 1962, con congressional testimony began, and this is a really nice picture of uh, Jerry Cobb and Janie Hart on, on the congressional floor um, testifying before the subcommittee on um, science and astronautics. They wanted to convince Congress that women had the potential to succeed in space. Um, on the last day of, or what turned out to be the last day of testing, um, there was uh, um, of testimony. Uh, there was uh, three prominent men who came into the uh, um, the chamber to testify against flying women in space. They included George Lowe, who was the head of the astronaut program, and John Glenn and Scott Carpenter, who had just come back from their own space flights. Um, these men were hailed as heroes. There were ticker tape parades in their honor in New York City um, and elsewhere. And many of the congressmen um, brought their children to the, to the chamber that day in order for their children to meet these heroes, to meet these, these American heroes, John Glenn and Scott Carpenter. Um, John Glenn took the stand and said, and this is a quote, the men go off and fight the wars and fly the jets and they come back. The fact that women are not in this field is a fact of our social order, right? So in John Glenn's testimony, he said, women aren't meant to fly in space. They're not meant to fly jet airplanes. They're meant to be at home as wives and mothers for us men who do get to do these kinds of things. And in a testimony that continues to be debated as to motive, when Jackie Cochran took the stand, even though she had been promoting and funding this Women in Space program for a few years now, she asked, might including women hurt the program? We've shown, and I'm paraphrasing, we've shown that men are very good space explorers, they're very good astronauts. If we allow the weaker sex to go into space, might that hurt the program? And it's not quite clear why she took this turn of testimony, but it's there. And as I said, it continues to be debated by historians. Um, at the end of that day, the hearings were terminated. Uh, Cobb and Hart had no opportunity for rebuttal and essentially the program was shut down. Some of the White House staffers, however, felt that there should be some kind of an inquiry into NASA, into the NASA administration. And so a letter from the White House that was written by a White House staff member um, states to the um, uh, director of NASA at the time, I'm sure you agree that sex should not be a reason for disqualifying a candidate for orbital flight. Could you please advise me the president at the White House, if NASA has disqualified candidates because they're women. And asking, are any women, are there any women in the United States who might meet these qualifications? This letter, however, was never sent. Um, and uh, what was unearthed during um, the researchers' investigations when writing about these stories, when writing about the Mercury 13, writing about these, these lady astronaut tra trainee, um, uh, trainees, uh, they found the letter uh, signed by uh, Lyndon B. or not signed, I'm I should say, by Lyndon B. Johnson, and instead written across it in his handwriting, let's stop this now and file. So this letter was never sent to NASA. And as you might expect, no American astronauts of this group of women f flew into space. Um, but that did not stop the Soviets, right? The Soviets were still working on sending women into space. And in 1963, they selected uh, Valentina Tereshkova. Uh, she was one of five women who were selected into space. 
Um, and this was uh, this idea of getting a Soviet woman into space was very much pushed by uh, Nikolai Kamenin, um, who had heard that the United States had this um, a private uh, testing program. Um, he, he wrote, we cannot allow that the first woman in space will be an American. This would be an insult to the patriotic Soviet women. We must have a woman in space. So uh, to Valentina Tereshkova launched in 1963, she's orbited the Earth 48 times, spending almost three days in space. Um, but the story is not meant to show how the Soviet uh, community, the Soviet, uh, the Soviets were so far advanced and so far improved in promoting women in space, because she was the first and only woman to fly for almost 20 years. It wasn't until 1982 that the next Soviet woman flew in space, Svetlana Savitskaya. Um, and the Soviets to this day have only flown four or five women in space, not nearly the number that the United States has flown. <clears throat> so what's the aftermath of this program? Well, the aftermath is that a lot of people started to take notice. Right? They started to take notice that there had been women in, um, who were tested, that women were just as capable of, of, of flying in space. The Soviet women woman had done it after all. Um, and there was also a movement um, uh, politically in our country to have equal rights for everyone. And NASA in particular um, was dominated by white males, um, all of the Mercury 7, all of the Gemini, all of the Apollo astronauts, were white males, and um, as written by a federal officer of the civil rights um, evaluation, um, in view of the important part that this program or NASA plays in our lives and the great psychological impact that media coverage of our manned space efforts has on millions of people around the world, this figure, if true, is most distressing. So with this letter to NASA then, NASA decides that it's gonna open up its astronaut core to everyone uh, recruit um, across all genders and all ethnicities. They placed ads in lots and lots of trade magazines. And in particular, they started recruiting a very particular kind of astronaut known as a mission specialist. So these are people who don't have military pilot licenses, which is the requirement for being a, a, a pilot of a, of a um, NASA space vehicle, but rather have PhDs um, or have medical degrees that allow them then to act as scientists or doctors, not pilots, in the space program. So in 1978, NASA hired the first women and minority astronauts. These were known as the uh, 35 new guys or the swear word, new guys, depending on which way you want to interpret the acronym and which source you read. Um, but this, these 35 new astronauts um, were known as Group 8. They included six women um, um, and mothers. There were three African-American males, one Asian-American male. Many of them, of course, were pilots because we needed pilots to fly this newfangled space vehicle called the Space Shuttle. And um, the rest of them were this new class of astronauts called mission specialists. Among this class of 35 new guys was Brewster Shaw, who was born and lived in Cass City, Michigan. So on the left-hand side, you can see the six women um, who were selected. The right-hand side, you can see the three African-American males and then the group picture here at the bottom. So it was very much the most diverse class of astronauts NASA had ever selected. Sally Ride, as we know, became the first American female astronaut in space. She had a PhD in physics from Stanford. She was a nationally ranked tennis player. And in 1983, she became the first American woman in space. Uh, she was asked questions like, how are you going to put on your makeup? What kind of clothes are you going to wear? What's your hair going to look like? Those are questions the media never asked any of the men, but she took it in stride. She knew the pressure and she knew the kind of role model she was being made out to be and the kind of role model she was by being the first American woman in space. Um, the first lady astronaut trainees, these uh, Mercury 13 were very happy of course to see a woman astronaut, but 
she wasn't a pilot, right? And the first American pilot uh, was finally selected and assigned to a space flight in 1995. This is Eileen Collins. She had a distinguished military pilot career. She's from Elmira, New York, and she was the first um, pilot to actually sit left seat um, uh, on the space shuttle. Um, she had heard about these Mercury 13 women um, during some of her training, but not a lot of people knew about them and many people didn't even know if, she if they were still alive. Uh, at a, uh, she actually had the honor of meeting 10 of them at, um, at, at a post, uh, at a pre-launch party. And she was just very grateful for all of the work and all of the um, success that they had had with these tests because she thinks she had said, um, again, in Martha Atman, Ackman's um, book, what, what would have happened if they had failed? Right, the 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 success that these these female um, uh, that these lady astronaut trainees had in these tests really showed that women could endure the same sorts of stresses that as men did and help propel the idea um, of 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 more people of of different genders and ethnicities um, exploring space. Um, was there a, a, a second chance? Uh, many of you might recall that in 1998, John Glenn was selected to fly again in space. He had never flown after he became the first man to actually orbit the Earth. Uh, NASA and others were afraid of a crash, uh, as happened to Yuri Gagarin, who actually died um, several years after he became the first man in space. They were afraid that the same thing was gonna happen to John Glenn, that we would lose this national hero in some kind of tragic accident. So he was essentially uh, barred from ever flying in space again. But after he took some time as a congressman and senator, as a senator, he um, was actually selected for uh, what's known as NASA's geriatric study. And um, Jerry Cobb at the time was still very young, relatively speaking, and very fit. And she said, well, if, if there's an old man going into space, why shouldn't there be an old woman going into space? And she petitioned that um, the geriatric space study should also include an older woman, right? Have, what, what happens to an old guy? What happens to an older woman in space? Seems like a good study to me from the science side, um, but her petition was denied. Um, and um, as you note down here, NASA never flew another elderly person in space, male or female. So these women um, at the then are now no longer forgotten. Uh, the selection of Eileen Collins as the first pilot and then commander of, of the space shuttle really brought these women back um, into the spotlight. Several different books were written about them. Um, Tethered Mercury here, that's B. Stedman's autobiography. Uh, she's the woman from Michigan, from Traverse City. That's an excellent book. And then Mer the Mercury 13 here in the middle um, in, published in 2003 by Martha Ackman. These are the two books I've used as my sources. Um, also a very good book um, here on the right-hand side, The Right Stuff, Wrong Sex. This is actually written by a historian who, uh, at the Smithsonian. And so uh, that is a very, it's more of a um, academic read, but still very, very good if you're interested in the uh, details, the real technical details of the programs and the politics um, involved in the, the, uh, in, in, in the non-selection, if you will. Um, in 2007, the Mercury 13 were uh, awarded honorary degrees from UW Oshkosh. So this is something near and dear to my heart because I grew up near Oshkosh in Wisconsin. And Oshkosh is the home of the Experimental Aircraft Association or what's known as the um, Aviation Fly-In. Um, it's one of the, lar it is the largest experimental aircraft fly-in in the world. And on opening day, Oshkosh, uh, population 60,000 becomes the busiest airport in the world and they actually land three airplanes on at a time on opening day. Um, because of that strong connection to aviation, the University of Wisconsin at Oshkosh awarded honorary degrees to the Mercury 13. So that was a really special um, opportunity for all of us. So my question to you then, um, and maybe um, you know this kind of interaction makes it a little bit difficult, but has anyone from Michigan actually been in space? So I'll let you think about that for a minute while I take a drink of water. <laughs> 
Okay, we have at least one guess. Um, let's see, Kathy says, Jim Lovett. All right, any others? No one else seems to be venturing a guess at this point. Okay, well, three of the men, uh, three, uh, not Jim Lovett, um, he actually, I believe, um, went to the University of Michigan, um, but is not actually from Michigan. Um, Roger Chaffee uh, was born in Grand Rapids. He was uh, one of the astronauts who was actually killed in the fire on Apollo 1 on the launch pad, along with um, Gus Grissom and Ed White. Uh, so he was born in Grand Rapids and there's a, a road named after him um, in Grand Rapids, which is kind of cool. I drove on it kind of accidentally <laughs> the last time I was there and I was like, oh, hey, that's amazing. Um, Jack Lusma and Al Warden are still alive. Um, they, uh, Jack Lusma was actually born in Grand Rapids as well. He um, was on the receiving end of the Apollo 13 call, Houston, we've had a problem. And he was slated to be the lunar module pilot on Apollo 20, which was canceled when interest in the space program started to wane in the early 1970s. Al Warden was actually born in Jackson, Michigan. So that's pretty exciting. And he was the Apollo 15 command module pilot. He was part of what's known as the all Michigan crew where all three astronauts on Apollo 15 were um, educated at the University of Michigan. Um, and in my, uh, what I want to um, just emphasize is that uh, getting to the moon was kind of a big deal. And the um, astronauts did an amazing job, um, both scientifically and technology, technologically and engineering wise. Of course, Apollo 13 was the successful disaster. It showed how everybody could work together to save um, our astronauts when they were in, a, in, in dire, dire straits. Um, when the oxygen tank blew on um, their mission. Uh, the samples that they brought back, 800 pounds of samples continue to unlock mysteries about the moon, about the earth and about our solar system in general. And you know, 50 years later, we're still celebrating Apollo. Um, Apollo 14 just celebrated its 50th anniversary and in 2022, we'll celebrate the 50th anniversary of Apollo 17. So these are all very, very exciting missions to reflect on and to think about the progress we've made and the exploration of our solar system and our moon and Mars in particular going forward. <clears throat> um, Apollo rocks um, exist here in Michigan. Um, and if you have a chance to get to uh, Lansing in particular, you can find the Apollo 11 Goodwill Rock, which is on display at the Historical Museum. The Apollo 17 rock is missing. So if you know where it is, let me know. No questions asked, promise. Um, uh, but all of the states in the union and all of the countries in the world got a piece of the moon in honor of the goodwill that the United States showed in landing humans on the moon. We are now thinking about returning to the moon. Um, we are now thinking about returning to the moon with um, commercial uh, uh, commercial space vehicles as well as um, NASA space vehicles. Uh, but the ties to Michigan continue very strongly. Uh, there are several um, active astronauts who have ties to Michigan, including Josh Cassida, who is a 1995 graduate of the physics program at Albion College. So we're very proud of Josh. And it's been wonderful to get to know him on a personal level because of his ties to our department. Drew Fostel comes to mid-Michigan fairly frequently um, as a visitor to different classrooms. And Christina Koch, who was born in Grand Rapids, um, actually gained some fame earlier in 2019 when she was part of the first all-female extravehicular activity um, working outside of the space station. So she and her uh, partner uh, were the first all uh, were the first women um, to work together as a team, solely as a team 
on uh, fixing some items outside of the space station. In 2019, she broke the endurance record for longest continuous time for women in space by a woman. And in February of 2020, just in time for the pandemic, uh, she returned to space, uh, uh, sorry, returned to Earth after 328 days in space. So she's quite um, a hero in her own right. Uh, she is one of nine women um, of 18 astronauts total who have been identified as being um, the next uh, people to actually set foot on the moon. So the Artemis program is building up to landing humans on the moon by 2024. And there's a sequence of commercial landers, um, uh, a lunar orbiter called Gateway and uh, different uh, commercial satellites and landers that will start to pave the way for the next humans on the moon to people, including the first woman. So Christina Kolk could very well be the first woman on the moon by 2024, should technology and funding um, exist in order for us to do that safely and return them to Earth. The Apollo era women are still being honored um, the intersection of NASA headquarters is now known as Hidden Figures Way. And last week, the headquarters building of NASA in Washington, D.C. was named after Mary Jackson, one of the computers who um, helped us understand uh, the math behind getting uh, our astronauts off of Earth, orbiting around Earth, and then safely returning to Earth. In 2019, the Hidden Figures received um, the Congressional Gold Medal, and um, I have um, started a petition to actually try to get the Congressional Gold Medal for the First Lady Astronaut trainees as well. So if you're interested in learning more about that petition, you can go to my website, campus.lbn.edu slash nzellner, scroll to the, to the December 2018 post, and I have links on there um, where you can um, sign the petition. And with that, I'll say thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me into your library. Thank you for coming to um, this talk. Thank you for um, spending yet more time in a virtual environment on a Zoom screen. And um, if you're interested in the full story of the Mercury 13, I encourage you to check out the Michigan History Magazine from uh, July and August of 2020, where I write an in-depth article um, about these women. And then the Michigan Connections um, were written up in, in 2019. So both of these uh, magazines magazines um, talk about Michigan ties to space exploration. Thank you very much. Great. And we do have those magazines at the library. Thank you so much, Nicole. I really appreciate it. Um, uh, if anyone has any question uh, for Nicole, I'm, I'm monitoring the Q&A and chat. Uh, feel free to do so now if you have anything. And no, I can't imagine being in space for a year and then coming back and sheltering in place from the pandemic for a year. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> right, well, you know, I have to give lots of props to NASA because of course in, in May we launched two men on the first commercial space vehicle um, uh, and they uh, quarantined, they were quarantined from their families ahead of time and they quarantined so that they could safely arrive at the space station um, on without any um, symptoms or, or chances of coming down with COVID. Yeah, that, I could see where that would be a problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't see any questions. So I think uh, you have uh, already answered any question that anyone could have had. Um, so interesting. Thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. And um, have a good evening, everybody. Yeah, and if anybody would like to um, contact me via email, um, that's fine. Um, I have contact, I put contact information in my slides, or I'm sure Phil could get that for you as well. Thank you. Absolutely. And we'll be posting this video um, on YouTube uh, shortly, so you'll have that there too. Bye. All right. Thank you. Bye.